Uh, thank you all for coming. This is the 12 o'clock talk on uh, the wild and wonderful world of 8-bit microprocessors. And I'll be doing a focus on, uh, on the MOS 6502. Um, I do apologize. There is not much of a demo in this, part, in this talk. I was hoping to have more of a demo, but I've had some technical problems. So this we're going to go more in it, more of history and technology. Uh, for some of you, this might be stuff you've never heard of before. Uh, that's what it's all about. And I have quite a few slides with a lot of resources and information. So you're certainly welcome, and I encourage you guys to take pictures of them. Um, I've been actually at, w adding to these slides, so they might not have, they're not going to have the latest version. So let me start. My name is Michael Brown. Uh, this is my normal bio I do with these talks, which I typically talk about InfoSec stuff. This isn't an InfoSec talk, so um, I'm not going to really go over this. Uh, but why am I here? Um, I actually grew up in the era of 8-bit computers. You know, when I was a kid, uh, it was the Apple II and the Atari 8-bit, Commodore 8-bit. Uh, my first game console was an Atari 2600. Uh, my first computer was actually an Atari 800XL, which I got around in 84 when I was going to college. And I can tell you that it was a big change going from writing papers on a typewriter to using a word processor to write up my papers. And um, I remember an incident when I turned in one of my first papers to my English teacher that I use on the word processor. And she marked off the fact that I didn't put quotes around the book, all the titles. And I had to go and take it back to her and say like, no, 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 no. I italicized the titles. They don't need to be quoted. And she didn't realize that. And then of course, gave me back the points because that was just, it was just too new at that time. Uh, my second computer was an Atari 1040 STFM. Um, you will impress me if you come up afterwards and tell me what that means without looking it up. Uh, when I was in college, among other things, I actually did programming in the 6502 and the 68000. Um, you know, these are some of the computers I use, and I used these wonderful programming languages that maybe some of you know of, maybe you don't. Later on, I did do, do C. I still got my computers. I've added to my collection. I don't have a huge collection, but I, you know, I enjoyed using these computers at the time. Um, I enjoy using modern computers. What I find kind of disappointing with a lot of people who get into computer science is they because I'm, I'm a computer science major. I was never a computer engineer. I wasn't, you know, hardware wasn't what I was about. I was about writing software. But my view is always from the beginning was I'm writing software. It runs on a computer. I should know about the hardware. And unfortunately, what I saw was a lot of computer science majors. The computer was just a black box. Yeah, I remember talking to them and asking them, hey, what, what processor is in that computer? And they're like, eh, I don't know. Um, and of course, today it's even worse. Um, I know that my computer here, my laptop is a Core i7, but I'd have to look it up to find out which of the 20 some generations of the i7 uh, it is or what capabilities because, you know, nowadays we're just pretty much oblivious. So kind of the outline, we'll talk about some of the timeline, computer types. Um, we're going to get into like some of the semiconductor companies, which I find kind of interesting. Uh, we'll look at, you know, more about the microprocessor units. We'll look more at the 6502. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about assembly language, which it's either something that is really interesting to you or freaking boring. You know, it's, or, you know, the worst thing possible. And, and then I want to, I put together a lot of good resources, at least a lot of things that I think are good resources. Um, so I encourage you guys to take sh pictures of that. So the timeline of the 70s, which is what I said, this is when I was in high school. Um, you know, we had Intel came out with the 8080, which kicked off the microcomputer era. We have the Altair, you know, followed up in, in by other processors. You know, you had the Apple II, the Commodore, um, you know, the TRS-80 Model 1, the so-called Trash 80, as everyone called it. Um, and so forth in, into the 70s, the TI's computer uh, and the rest. And then in the 80s, we get more, we get the VIC-20, the Commodore 64, the IBM PC, um, the Macintosh, and then of course, you know, the 
Macintosh, the ST, the Amiga. I, I didn't want to go further because now we're getting outside of 8-bit. Um, when I was doing this, I, I wondered, should I get into risk processors? Because that's another whole you know topic and that's kind of interesting and kind of sad. Um, so I didn't want to kind of overwhelm things. When we talk about computer types, there's a lot of different ways to categorize them. These are the ones that I understood when I was into computer science. We talked about the mainframes, he had mini computers, and he had microcomputers. And and I, I'll be honest, this is the di the distinction I've always been told about what why why is this a mainframe? Why is this a mini computer? And usually the way they said it's like, well, it's about size. Your mainframes were your huge room-based computers, the ones you see in the TVs and movies with the, the, the tape drives going and whatnot. And the mini computers were smaller the size of a refrigerator. Um, earlier on, it was, you know, these companies, you know, IBM and these others, they were called Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Through mergers, it became IBM and the Bunch. Um, and today, yes, mainframe computers are still being made, but now by these these companies. Um, the mini computers were kind of interesting. You had, you know, digital and data, data general and all these others, and they no longer exist. You know, there are no mini computers as a market, and almost all those companies either don't exist or they've moved out. Uh, microcomputers started, of course, as the small, you know, more of a hobbyist, getting into the business computers with the MIT or the MITS, uh, m size Soul, you know, then the Apple Atari Commodore. But as microprocessors became more and more powerful, you now had microprocessor-based servers, and those kind of moved in and wiped out the mini computers. Um, and then I debated to putting a lower level, which would have been your microcontrollers, which in many cases are microprocessors being used to control hardware, uh, you know, disk drives and this sort of stuff. So let's talk about micro, micro semiconductor manufacturers is kind of interesting. Uh, the first major one is called Shockley Semiconductor. It was founded by the guy who created transistors, a guy named William Shockley. Uh, unfortunately, Shockley was one of these people who is like a brilliant, you know, scientist, a lousy manager. So he established his company, he brought all these engineers on board, he trained them, um, they didn't like working for him and they left. And these people, there was eight of them, and they are known as, and I'm not, I'm not making this up, they are the traitorous eight who left Shockley Semiconductor to go found a new company called Fairchild Semiconductor. And Fairchild was a subsidiary of Fairchild Camera. And we have Fairchild Semiconductor for having Silicon Valley. They, they literally created Silicon Valley. They were established in, in California. And then the funny thing was with, with Fairchild is many of the people that came to Fairchild left to establish other companies, and sometimes even left those and established other companies, and these are referred to as the Fair Children. And there's even, you can go online and you can see these charts of all these companies that have been like second generation from Fairchild that spread this knowledge of the semiconductors. Um, Fairchild's big claim to fame is that they were one of two companies that created the integrated circuit that gives us all the computer chips that we use today. They did create their own microprocessor, which until recently I didn't even know existed, called the F8. And they created their own game console called the Channel F, which I again have to admit, I don't remember that when I was a kid. Um, it, but the big thing that was made the Channel F important is it was the first one to use ROM cartridges for the games, which became the standard of all the game consoles that followed. You know, all the Ataris, use game consoles, the, the uh, Nintendo and Super Nintendo and the Sega Genesis and all those all use ROM cartridges until they came along and started using CDs. One of the big uh, fair children is this little company called Intel, which was for, it stood for Integrated Electronics, very, very creative name. Um, and it was actually some of the guys that were the, the Trader State that went and founded Intel. Intel, when they were established, made memory chips. That's really what they did. But what made a difference is when 
was when a Japanese calculator company went to them and said, hey, we need some chips made because we're gonna make four sets of, of calculators and we need chips in them to make them function. And they were saying like, well, okay, we have four calculated with different features. So why don't you make us four sets of chips for these four, four calculators? Uh, but one of the engineers at Intel said like, no, nah, that's not a good idea. Let's make one set of chips that we can program and use in all four of these. And that, what they created was the 4004, which is a four bit processor. And that was actually the first microprocessor. It was then replaced with a better 4040. Um, and then uh, shortly thereafter, another calculator company came with the same thing and the same engineers then created the 8008, now an eight bit processor. And then they made it better and created the 8080. And again, they created these to be used in calculators. No one created these for being to be used in computers. It took other people to look at this and go like, hey, I can take this 8080 chip and make it into a computer. And those were the guys at MIT at MITS or MITS, depending on who what you believe is the name of the company. And that was the Altair 8800, which was it's not the first personal computer, but it was the first um, commercially available personal computer and that kicked it all off and of course the people that wanted these were more people that were hobbyists and engineers they they you know at that time as i said you had many computers and mainframes that you didn't get to sit at and work on the computers people wanted their own computer that they could have and, and work on and do stuff with as well as now they can be used for for practical purposes and businesses shortly thereafter Intel created the 8086, which is now a 16-bit processor. And that then, of course, was used for more powerful computers. They then started a series of kind of iterations that gave us the 8186 and so forth. You know, the, the, the 286, the 386. The 386 is now a 32-bit processor. So now we're moving up and becoming more and more powerful um, than the 486. The next one was supposed to be the... 8586, but instead Intel decided to call it a Pentium because you can't copyright a number, but you can copyright a name. Um, and then with the Pentium, there was all the various different variations of the Pentium, which I'm sorry, I, I can't, I couldn't keep up with it even at the time. You had the Pentium 2 and the 3 and the 4 and the DX and so forth. Um, I think around the, the Pentium 4 is when they went to 64 bit. Uh, Intel also tried their hand at RISC processors. That's the I-86, 860, and 960. Um, those are dead. Um, most of the other ones, they actually made them for, for several decades, but then stopped doing so. And then there was also the Itanium. That was another architecture they tried out that um, was useful for a while, and it's also dead. Nowadays, it's the one on the next line, the, uh, the Atom and the Celeron, which are the low power ones for, meant for like tablets and embedded systems. Uh, the Core 3579, which for laptops and desktops, and then and the Xeon for, for servers. One thing that I've, I've noticed in the last few years with Intel, and maybe others of you have, have noticed the same thing, is that Intel is still pretty big with desktops and laptops and servers but that's it. Um, they, you know, they tried getting into smartphones. That didn't go. They tried getting into uh, like the Ardu uh, Arduino space. There was actually an Intel-based Arduino called the 101. That didn't last. They tried getting into the single board computer like the Raspberry Pi. Uh, I'm not sure how many people here remember the Minnow board that they put together. Yeah, that didn't last. They've tried other little IoT devices like the uh, you know, the Edison, which you know I got, and several others. And you know, it's like outside of desktop servers and laptops, Intel doesn't exist. Everything else is ARM. You know, every one of you who has a smartphone with you, that's an ARM-based processor. You know, I seriously doubt you have anything that's not an ARM-based smartphone. Um, ARM is 
now being used by Apple for their systems. Um, there is actually already, we're seeing ARM-based laptops that will run Windows. I'm hearing of ARM-based servers. So I don't know what that means. That, you know, so it's kind of interesting what's happening. Um, subbing back, I mentioned that certain engineers at Intel had created the 4040 and the 8080. Um, those were a gentleman by the name of Federico Fagan, uh, along with a Japanese engineer named Masatoshi Shima. They actually left Intel to form Zilog, which is, and I'm not joking, it's, it was in picked because it's the, the last name in integrated electronics. And they created the Z80, which was a much improved version of the 8080. So improved that the Z80 in the market kind of displaced the 8080 from systems. And so everyone who was using what would have been an 8080 based system was using a, a Z80. Um, and until April of this year, they were still manufacturing the original Z80 chip and selling it. Um, that's not the end of the Z80. They have replacement chips such as the EZ80 Z80. you can still get. So you can still get Z80 chips and, and use them. They tried their hand at others. They did a Z800, which is a 16-bit processor. Um, and then they, uh, they went with a 32-bit with a Z80,000. And if you're like, oh, I never heard of those, well, um, it wasn't that successful. Uh, these are what we refer to, and I don't know if I, where I got the term from, is these are the eights. That almost the processors use the letter eight, the number eight on it. The other set that we talk about that's really major starts off with Motorola. Um, they start off with the Z, uh, the 6800 processor. Um, it had some success. Um, a lot of the early computer companies, uh, MITS and MSI, did release 6800-based systems with an 8-bit processor, but it wasn't that big. Uh, they replaced it with a more powerful 6809, which is an 816-based system. Probably its fit claim to fame is it was one used in the Tandy color computer, which was used for many years. And I was actually really surprised to learn how much uh, involvement Motorola had in actually the creation of the color computer, which I never knew. I learned that, you know, in like the last couple of years. Uh, then, of course, much more famously is a 6800, uh, sorry, 68000, which is, of course, used in the Macintosh, the ST, the Commodore, many Unix workstations. Um, Sega Genesis used it and, and so forth. So a very, very popular processor. They then extended that, the, the 68000 is um, a 16-32-bit bit system, mm -hmm. and then the full 32-bit was a 68020, or the 020 as we call it, and there was a progression of those, the, the 020 through 060, which was used in subsequent Macintoshes, Amigas, and then, um, Atari systems. Uh, Motorola also got, the, got into trying their hand at risk processes with the 88000. Um, however, in the mid 90s, they got involved with the AIM consortium, which was Apple, IBM, and Motorola to compete against the Windows, sorry, the uh, Mac, Microsoft um, Intel duopoly. Um, and they were going to make, you know, and part of that was going to, was the PowerPC. Now, the PowerPC was a risk based architecture from IBM, but the idea was that Motorola and IBM would create the chips. Um, Motorola, IBM, and Apple would all build PowerPC systems. Um, Apple would move Macintosh to PowerPC and so forth. Uh, the funny thing is, is, as I was actually at IBM at that time and then went to Motorola, so I got to see a lot of PowerPC based systems that never got to market. There were, there were some cool ones, but that's just how it is. Going back to the 6800, um, as I said, that was Motorola's, you know, 8-bit processor initially, and uh, there were some problems with it. One thing they discovered from uh, feedback from their customers or potential customers was that, one, they thought it was just a little bit too powerful for what they needed, um, but more importantly, uh, a lot of their potential customers thought it was too expensive as a chip. A Motorola was, was charging 
over $300 for a chip. And you need to understand is that when you're building a system, yes, you know, your, your, your CPU chip is important, but there's also other chips you need. And if it's already 300 bucks for that CPU chip and then add the others, then you have kind of an expensive system. And that was a problem. One of the engineers at Motor, Motorola by the name of Chuck Pedal was involved with that. And he was like trying to work out a, a low cost alternative at Motorola for the 6800 until basically Motorola told him to knock it off. Yeah, and so he wasn't happy by that. Some of those people were, weren't happy, so they left Motorola. And this was a group of people that included Chuck Pedal, uh, an associate by the name of uh, Bill Minch, and they left Motorola and they went to the next company on the on that on the slide there. So let me make a couple of things really clear about this company um, because a lot of people get this wrong, get these two things wrong. I've seen it in, in YouTube channels. Um, on videos on YouTube that are incorrect. So first of all is, how do you say its name? Um, if you think it's MOS technology, you're wrong. It is MOS technology because you don't want to confuse it with another company that exists at the time called MOS Tech, which I listed up there. And that's very true because I know as a kid, well, at the time when I was even confused myself, um, the next thing that I've seen that several vi videos would claim is that Chuck Pedal and the other guys from Motorola founded MOS technology. No, they did not. MOS had already been in existence for several years as a, again, as a me uh, memory co company. They just joined the company. There they created two chips, the 6501 and the 6502. And if you got going, well, I've heard of the 6502. Uh, I never heard of the 6501. Well, there's a reason. Let me explain it. These two chips are are largely the, are mostly the same in terms of architecturally. Um, it was meant to be a scaled down version of 6800. I'll show. I'll show. I'll explain that shortly. Um, but there were some differences. Uh, the main difference is the 6501 was pin con compatible compatible with the 6800. That means if you're if you have a board that you designed to use the 6800, you can then go get a 6501, which would be way 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 cheaper, and plop it in and off you off you run. Yeah, you know, the opcode would would not be compatible. You would still have to program it, but you would save your development time because you've got you know you've already got a board that'll use it. Um, Motorola didn't like that and they sued them, so they never brought it to market. I don't understand how you can sue over that. I mean, you you know, you copyright your pinouts. I don't I don't understand that because Intel didn't, as far as I know, never never you know uh, sued Zilog about the Z80. So uh, I don't understand that. So anyway, so the 6502 is what came out. Um, they did make a lot of different derivatives, things that were like slightly diff different of it, and so forth. MOS technology. Uh, existed in a separate company. Commodore later soon bought them out so they would have a ready source of chips. So they also were the ones that manufactured the specialized chips for the Commodores and the Amiga computers. Um, and unfortunately, MOS went under when Commodore went under. However, one of those other guys I mentioned, Bill Minch, he left Commodore and formed his own company called Western Design Company. I had to be kind of careful. Some of the say Western Digital, which is wrong. Um, and then he licensed the 6502 chip to make it because that was the common thing there is you'd have multiple companies making chips. Then what he did was he teamed up with a, with a couple other the companies that were making 6502 and they developed a new version of it called the 65CO2. The C means it's made using CMOS. Um, and it's an improved version of 6502. They fixed some bugs, they added some op codes, um, and they still make them today. If you want a 6502 chip today, you can still buy them. They're a few bucks. You can go to like DigiKey and Mouser and those guys and you can still get it. Um, shortly thereafter, he made a new version and that's the 65816, which is an 816 bit version of the 6502 it can emulate fully the 6502 or it can go you know an 816 uh bit processor 
Um, it's best known and use has been in the Apple II GS, which was not quite the last Apple II, but probably one of the best ones. Um, and it was used in the Super Nintendo. So if you use a Super Nintendo, guess what? You use that. So that's, and these, as I said, the other group is compute processor, that's the eights. So these are the sixes. There are a few other companies I just want to quickly mention Texas Instrument. Um, huge in calculators, still big in calculators. Uh, but I was surprised to learn that, that for a period of time, they actually made many computers. Um, they took that architecture and made a processor called the TMS-9900, uh, which they used in their computer called the TI-99-4, which I remember it, it was it was uh, an interesting computer. I'll say it that say it that way. The, the the processor was an 816 processor. The problem was was you know I there there is debate whether it was kind of a crippled design because of infighting within the company. So it wasn't very successful. Um, another company which is I, I I thought I should list more as a could have been is National Semiconductor. Um, they had a series of chips called the 32,000, and um, I do know that Atari looked at them, maybe Amiga looked at them as possibly the, the processor for the next generation, but they didn't go with them and said they went to Mot with Motorola 68,000. So who knows what might have happened if that didn't, that didn't go. Um, the last one I'll mention is RCA. Yes, yes, that's Radio Communications of America. They had an 8-bit processor called the uh, 1802. Um, all I would say for that is take a look at that on Wikipedia. It's very, very interesting. They actually use that in um, space probes. So kind of insane. Now, if you go like, like well, you, you forgot this company, you forgot that company. There are other companies out there. A lot of them, all they do is they make chips. They don't design chips. Um, even today, Apple designs their own software, their own silicon, they have the M1, 2, 3, and 4, but they don't make it. They go to another company and say, here, here's our design, make us these chips. Um, ARM, you know, ARM is nothing more than, you know, a licensing company. They don't make ARM chips. They design the ARM architecture. They give it to other companies like Broadcom and all the others, and they make it, you know. This has a, you know, an ARM processor in it. ARM didn't make it. They went to Broadcom and, you know, which is part, you know, tied to, to the Raspberry Pi people and they made it. That's just how it is. Um, I thought I should make, I should mention this because a lot of people don't understand again about, you know, if you don't understand the history of computers, when you think about the IBM PC and they, some people think how, oh, how radical it is and, you know, it's standardized things. Um, and that's just not quite the way it was. In the early 70s, we did have a standard, which was, you know, many companies, and I mentioned several, you know, Altair, MSI, Cromenco, and a lot of these others who built standard business computers. They used, used the Z80 chip. <clears throat> they had what was called the S100 bus, which also known as the Altair bus, which was an IEEE standard bus up until the, the mid-90s. People were still making S100 based systems. And they use CPM as the operating system. Um, but unfortunately, other than that, there was there was little standards. The, you know, floppies, dries was all over the place. You had eight, you know, eight inch, you had five and a quarter, you had um, you know, you might not know what the what I mean by hard sector and soft sector, double sided, double density. Uh, you know, is all a lot of complexity with with these things. It was pretty crazy. Um, look into the CPM operating system. Um, again, it's one of like what might have been uh, CP. We might have been using CPN instead of MS DOS if certain things had not gone certain ways. Um, it's either a either a ridiculous story or a sad story or however you want to look at it. Um, so and it, it goes a little bit beyond what I wanted to talk about here, but it is interesting. Uh, so um, I don't know if people, I've, I've been saying things like 8-bit, 16-bit, I've even said that like 8, 16. Um, does anyone know, understand what the hell I'm saying when I say these things? I see some hands raised. Okay, good. If that's the case, because a lot of people don't, it's it's ridiculous. Um, to to give you an example, 
Um, the, Atari came out with one of their game consoles toward the end called the Jaguar, which they toted as being a 64-bit system. And their, their mar marketing tagline was, you know, do the math. But if you look at the system, and I'm pretty positive that, no, it was not a 64-bit system. It was, I, th I think, either 16 or, or 32. That's the problem with these terminologies is that we as technology people, we understand that, oh, this is an 8-bit system. This is a 16-bit. Oh, yeah, we have an, we can have an 8-16 that's in between that's more powerful. But then you get to these marketing dweebs, and they just you know, do ridiculous things. I came across an article around this time where they talked about this system, and they were claiming it was a 64-bit system. And I'm like, well, wait, wait a minute. I know what the processor is in that system. It isn't it isn't a 64 bit and I'm reading the article and I'm realizing that the, the, the person who wrote it was like adding things together like, oh, well, it's, you know, I'm taking the address bus and the data bus and this and I'm adding them all together and it's 64 bit. So it's a 64 bit system. And I'm like, no, that's not how it works. Um, I was also surprised to learn because only because I never used these computers that we also had. 12 and 24 bit and 48 bit computers at one time, which I was surprised, but I never, I never use those. Um, you know, when we talk about processors, these are the things we look at, um, you know, clock speed. I remember people think that clock speed is real important and it's not as important as people think. Um, if you go and look, watch these YouTube vi videos where people are doing a, you know, they're looking at a new board and seeing how powerful it is, they're not going and looking at the dang clock speed. They're gonna run benchmarks to see, oh, how fast can it do these things? So that's more important. Um, but this is kind of interesting is that the 6502 has a 0.43 versus a 68,000 of 0.75. If that's not clear, that means that the 6502 is actually faster than the 68,000. But that's also gets into the logic of, you know, why, why we went with risk processors because, you know, they're more powerful because they're kind of stripped down. The address bus is entering that tells us how much memory we can access. Almost all 8-bit systems have a 24-bit address bus, which, which is why they only have 64K of memory. Um, the size and number of registers are kind of interesting because you got some CPUs that have like one or two registers and others with like multiple. Uh, if you don't understand what I mean by a register, that's the storage space, if you will, within the processor. If you're going to do anything, you have to pull it out of memory it into the processor and work with it. Uh, the data bus is what's important because that's the that's the that's the highway, the data highway within the computer that data is moving around. If you got an 8-bit processor, all the auxiliary chips need to be 8-bit. You can't be mixing and matching. Um, so I always like to throw this out, which is the IBM PC, which had all these capabilities. Um, how many people think this was a 16-bit system? How many people think this was an 8-bit system? Okay, good. It's an 8-bit system because the 8088 processor is really an 816-bit processor. So the PC is an 8-bit system, even though most people think it's 16 bits. Um, a lot of the, it's not, I really can't call them a clone in the early days, more of the IBM compatible. They were full 16 because they, they either use the 8086 or the 8186 and so forth. So it's actually kind of interesting. So let's get into you know, these chips. I talked about the 6800. Um, these are kind of the specs. I'm not going to read it. Um, that's actually what they look like. Please note it had 72 instructions, what we call opcode. Um, as I said, it was originally cost $360. That was in 70s dollars. Uh, then over time, they reduced it to 179 then to $69. I don't know how long they were making this, but you know, what I've been able to see is they were they were still making these for probably a couple of decades. Um, now I was trying to find a similar chart to what I show here for the 6502, but this I, I felt that was useful because again, people need to understand that when a company makes a processor, they're making other chips to to work with it. So in this case, you see that you know you have the 68,000 processor. In this case, they have a separate chip for the for the clock. Um, then they have, of course, ch chips for ROM and RAM. And then they have a PIA, that's a peripheral interface adapter, 
that's and then of course a communications adapter so the whole idea was that if, if motorola is not just selling you the processor that's what two of all these companies they're selling you the complete set of chips for your system uh, architecturally, this is what we look at when we look at the in inside with the with the registers. You see the 6800 versus the 6502. Uh, the 6800 had two registers. They got rid of one, uh, but otherwise they're pretty similar. They have index registers and stack registers and so forth. Those are all needed in inside the chip to do the work that it does. So then we have the 6502, which of course you see it's a, it looks just just the same. It's a, it's a four pin dip as it's called. It has only 55 instructions versus the 77 of the 6800. Um, so the funny thing is I've actually read some stuff where people have, com complain, have claimed, I don't know if that's true or not, is that the 6502 might be the first risk chip because they reduced the instruction set. I, I, I don't know who can make that dis determination, um, but that's what they did. Um, the original cost for this chip was $25. And one of the ways they were able to do this was not just that it was you know, a reduced design, was they were able to improve manufacturing. Now, as I understand it, and those of you who have more knowledge, you can, you can Get with me actor and tell me I'm I'm I got this wrong, but as I understand it, the chip yield at that time was pretty lousy. As in, you'd run a make a bunch of chips, and seventy percent of them were bad. Mm -hmm. I.e., you had to throw them away, which is why chips were so costly because the yield was so poor. But apparently, someone that you know, one of the Motorola engineers that came to MOS had worked out a way. I don't know what it is. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not an engineer in this area a way of fixing the chips after production such that they had a good yield going, it's going to being 70% bad to like 30% bad. And thus they were able to sell the chips a lot cheaper. And it was because of this price that a couple of guys by the name of Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak looked at this and go like, hey, this is the chip that we can use to put together this little home computer we've been thinking about which if you don't know who those people are, those are the guys that created the Apple One and the Apple Two and so forth. So, so what have been the 6502 been used for? A lot of stuff. Um, over, in, over in the UK, they, you know, the Acorn computers, the BBC Micro was used it. Uh, the Apple One, the Two and the Three and, and all the, the variations used it. Um, the Atari home uh, game systems, the Atari eight uh, eight bit systems used it. Uh, Commodore used it for their the, all the PEP models, the VIC 20, 64, and so forth. Uh, the Nintendo used it. Um, uh, others used it. And Bender from Futurama used the 6502. So, um, then of course, as I said, the 65816 chip was used in the 2GS and the Super NES. And as I said. Western Design is still making and, and selling these chips. Um, you know, that, that, that's all they do is they, as far as I know, they, that's pretty much what they manufacture. So clearly people are using these for a lot of embedded systems. Sadly, I don't know. They don't even say specifically what they're being used for, but it's got to be used heavily. Uh, another interesting computer is the Kim one, which was created by Chuck Peddle at MOS. It was a way to, it was a single board computer to kind of sell uh, the, the 6502. It was so cheap that people bought that. Um, those are very collectible. I have never, never seen one, so I'm not even sure. I think they were probably about yay big. Um, and if it's not clear, that keypad is basically hexadecimal numbers and some other commands. So no, it's not a typewriter keyboard. Um, I know that Commodore was still making these even though after they bought out um, MOS. And then of course some of the secondary sources for 652 made their own the the sim one and the aim 65 and then i found this kind of interesting slide um i thought was interesting it showed all the different systems the the clones of it that popped up um, i actually brought one that i've been building that i need to try to fix which is this is the pow one 
So you can see it's pretty small. It's got a keypad and LED. Um, there's something wrong with it. I got to try to figure out how to fix this. But you know, if you come to me, if you visit me at the hacker halt at the hardware hacking village, you can take have it. You can have a chance to take a look at it and so forth. That's why I brought it. So programming, which is always so much fun, which is uh, assembly language programming, which is either miserable or whatever. I think most people, if you've done programming, you've probably done high level programming. I know I have, you know, C and basic and Pascal and so forth. The way I look at it is these programs are written to make it easy for us to put in, put down our ideas into how a program should work. Um, but the thing is, is they have to be then converted into the language of the machines, which is machine code, which is, you know, binary coding and so forth. Um, how good that is, is unknown. That's why many people do still write, uh, do a semi-language programming because they can, you know, get down to the nitty gritty of the hardware and actually write to it. Uh, unfortunately, it's not really fun, but people do write it. I was actually surprised that if you visit uh, No Starch Press here, they actually have a book on ARM assembly language programming, and I think they also have one for x86 programming. So um, the thing is also with programming is when we do these higher level languages, there's things like, you know, an if-then statement. You know, if this condition has been met, then do this. If you get a for loop or a while loop and all that, um, they don't. That doesn't exist in assembly languages. You do have things like a, com, a compare command, like, hey, do these two things compare? Which is higher? Which is lower? But from that, then you have to build that logic of that if statement or that for loop and this sort of stuff. So it becomes a little bit more complex. Um, so. This is what 6502 looks like, and it's, I guess, three-letter coding. Um, and these are some of the ones in, like, there's an add with carry, there's the compare, there's the load the accumulator. That means you're grabbing uh, a, a number out of memory and pulling into the accumulator so you can do math on it. Um, the 6502 has only two math, com math commands. It can add and it can subtract, and that's it. If you want to do multiply and divide, you're going to have to use add and subtract. Um, so, and of course, if you have any sense, you're going to you're going to comment your code. Otherwise, we're going to look at your assembly language, your assembly code, and go like, I don't know what the hell you're doing here. If you would like to try out 6502 assembly language, I found this really cool website. It uses JavaScript, so you can actually do a semi-language programming there. And it's both not it's not just a, it's not just like, oh, here's a window to do a semi-language. It is done as a tutorial where you can go on there and you can you know put in the code, and you can see what it happens and so forth. And I also discovered this other one, which is an online tutorial. Um, yeah, feel free to take pictures of these. Um, these are really good. So this is what a semi-language looks like. Um, the left side is a semi-language to do a bubble sort. And then on the right side is bubble sort in a thing C. Um, so that looks like really, really fun things to write, um, which is probably why I don't recall doing a whole lot of, lot of semi-language even in college. Really simple stuff. OK, uh, this is the point where I would recommend you might want to pull your phones out because I'm going to be giving a lot of resources. You are totally free to, to take pictures. That's why I do this. Um, I'm always the mind of I'm here to help educate you and show you where you can go next after this. So websites, right at the top, 6502.org is like the place for anything about this, the 6502. There's Buku resources, uh, emulators, software sources, hardware, uh, tutorials, and everything like that. The other one is a neat one that I discovered. They have a lot of pages on the 6502 and so forth, and a lot on the Kim one, including PDF scans of a lot of the documentation, which I thought was really, really cool. Um, the last one is the Internet Archive. If you are interested in looking for books and you can't find them or they're really, really expensive, try going there and searching. You can probably find them. Uh, is PDF scan. So all the books I talk about, you can probably find them there if you don't want them. Me, I want physical books. That's that's just me. So, um, so 
I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Adam Osborne, the Osborne computer, but one of the things that I liked, liked about him is he had his own publishing company, which then became part of McGraw-Hill as Osborne McGraw-Hill, and it was one of my favorite sources for books. So he did a series called An Introduction to Microcomputers. I had um, four volumes, numbered zero through three, but I only recommend you look at getting the first two. You, you can get them really inexpensive off of like Amazon and eBay. Uh, make sure you get the, the last edition, but those are really, really good introduction to this. Um, uh, I don't have volume two and three. They go for, they people ask for stupid money for it and they're like, sorry, but um, if you really are into the, into the hardware of microprocessors, the last two books you might want to get, I actually got them. They're literally like about two inches thick. It's not, they're not going to tell you how to program these, but they're going to tell you about all the electronics and the hardware of these processors. And I, to me, that was like really, really cool. But I, I, I'm a nerd, so what, what can you say? When it comes to a semi-language program, one of my two authors is... Lance Leventhal, who did all these things through um, Osborne McGraw Hill, um, he did the 6502 one, which had a second edition. That's that's what it looks like. He also did an assembly language subroutine series, which I was not aware of, um, but I got the 6502 one recently. The his 68,000, I know I used that in college, but he did others. He did a 6800, a 6809, um, the Z8000, the 80. 85 and so forth, as well as um, uh, assembly language subroutines for several of these, these ones. Uh, please be advised that people are asking stupid money for these, but um, if you go on lulu.com, someone has made available his Z80 and the first edition of the 6502 book there on Lulu, and I think they cost about 20 bucks or 30, yeah, I think about 20 bucks or 30 bucks. So if you don't want to buy a used copy, go there. The other guy is Rodney Zacks, who founded Cybex Books, which is still around, but as an imprint of Wiley. He did actually a four book series on the 6502. Um, I know I used his 6502 book in college. The last one is the fourth edition with that really cool cover. Uh, I have most of the series. I'm trying to get the, I'm trying to find the application book, but I want that cover. Uh, but his other, he's got a really great Z80 book that I want to get. Again, I'm not going to pay the stupid money people are asking for, um, but he's another good one. Uh, I found on Tindy that someone had reprinted the uh, uh, these MOS books on the Kim one. I actually brought one of them with me uh, that you guys can take a look at. I got the user, user manual, um, but he had these on Tindy. Um, I, he might be running out. So if you want them, get them while the getting's good. Other books are these on the 65816. Uh, I've had the Osborne one, but I've never done programming. The last one was actually from Brady, but now Western Dig Design has reprinted it so you can easily get it off of Amazon. Um, but I've had people, I've read stuff that people don't think it's that good of a book for a semi-language program, so just be be aware. Um, I have not got it myself, so I cannot speak. So you want to actually play around and program with these. Well, you have various options. It's kind of depending on what you want. Um, do you want hardware or are you happy with software or something in between? That That's, that's up to you. Um, there are many communities of fans that still keep these things to going and they're actually creating new stuff. Um, I can actually have Wi-Fi on my Atari 8-bits. I can have I can use compact flash and SD cards for storage because of the work that these people have done. So, um, if you want, you can go get the classic 8-bit. You can go on the eBay and take a look. Just be aware that sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Most of the buyers are pretty honest. They'll say like, "No, this doesn't work. You're getting this for parts or whatever." You might need to do some retro brighting, which is to clean up the coloring and so forth. But um, yeah, I've gotten uh, an 800, a 1200 XL, and a 130XE off of, off of uh, eBay for what I thought was reasonable, reasonable prices. Um, so just, just be aware. If you want brand new, check out this. Um, this is an effort of a guy by the name of the 8-bit guy. It's a brand new 6502-based 65 65 system. 
They are currently making and selling developer systems. They cost about 300 bucks. Um, they're still having people developing software and so forth. So, but it, it looks, it's a, I think it's kind of a cool, cool project. So take a look at it. Um, like I said, you can do Kim one clones. Like I said, this, this is a Kim one clone. I got this off of Tindy and you, you can have, and I got the extra stuff. I'm trying to like get this thing to work and so forth. So, um, if you want different, there's all other, if you go into Tindy and just search, let's search for 65 two, you can find out there's, uh, the Pico computer. I actually brought mine with me. I, I still got to get that working. Um, the Roscoe is kind of interesting. It's, it's real old school computer. That's what the, that's what it stands for or you can do the other one but there's others that are there on tendy if you know it's like what you want do you want to you want a computer where you're going to have to basically hook it to your laptop and send it code and whatnot or do you want one that's more of a standalone computer with a with a keyboard and screen you know you, there's different options if you don't want that you can go hardware alternatives one is emulation through what's called field programmable gate array look into the mister project where people are, are emulating all kind of retro computers uh, in that in this sort of Mister system. Uh, you might have seen the various minis that have been hit in the market. There has been the Atari 400 mini and the Atari 2600 and the Commodore mini and the Amiga mini and uh, the Nintendo mini and the Sega mini and I'm probably missing some, but and they're all done with FPGA. Um, then there's this interesting one, which is the Mega 65 from Germany, which they have basically recreated what would have been Commodore's last 8-bit system using FPGA. Um, I thought about getting it until I looked at the price, and it's like, uh, not yet. So, and if you want, if you just, if you're not going, you just want software emulation, again, check out the 6502 or for that. Uh, videos, there's a lot of cool videos out there. Uh, what, the 8-bit guy is a neat guy. He's the guy that behind the, the uh, Commander X-16. Low-spec gamer has some neat videos. The first one is on the 6502. He did one of the Z-80. Um, recommend you look up his one on the arm. You will then learn why you, you have the 6502 to thank for, the, for, for, for ARM processors. So, um, and also look for videos with Chuck Peddle, Bill Minch, Rodney Zacks, and all these other guys. They're really, really cool. You want events and groups, there's the Vintage Computer Federation. And I was really shocked that they have these all around the country as well as overseas. Um, and look for groups in your area that are into retro computing. So uh, if you want to contact me, that's my Twitter handle. I am, I am on the DEF CON Discord as well as there's one for the makers community. So if you want to reach out to me, that's great. That's my LinkedIn. Um, I would recommend you read it. There's a retro tech community uh, over there someplace that you can drop by then. Uh, I was disappointed they had no Atari stuff. I'm sorry, I'm an Atari. And, um, and there's also the Hardware Hacking Village. After this, I'm gonna head over to the Hardware Hacking Village. I'll, I'll have uh, a few of my things with me. If you wanna talk with me and tell me I'm an idiot. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. I shouldn't have been here um, or what have you, or you have questions and comments and whatnot. I'm I'm ha I'm happy to hang out there, and you can see you can. I'll even let you touch my stuff. So, um, thank you very much, and I will see you all later.